Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Gosha, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Tomek, and I'm going to talk about documentation strategy. This is my third SOAP conference, but first one as a speaker, and this is also my debut on the stage, so please be understandable. A few words about me. So I'm from Wrocław, uh, a beautiful Polish city. Uh, maybe not so beautiful as uh, Krakow, but uh, anyways, I really recommend visit if you haven't. And, you know, I'm a global documentation manager at, at Unit4, and I'm in uh, TechCom since 2009. Privately, I'm a husband, dad, and I love coffee, and I'm a football maniac. So probably I know better what's the Krakowia or Wisła Kraków squad than, for example, what Dita is or topic-based writing. Uh, I'm joking. Uh, let me share some thoughts uh, about my experience, my past experience, because I started at Nokia Networks uh, as a technical writer, and from the very beginning, I had lots of questions. I didn't know who my SME is, how to get the input, how to publish my documents, uh, what should I write? Should I write this or that? And being a, being a tech, tech writer, and if you are a new tech writer, you have lots of questions. And actually, I thought uh, when, I, when I got a, an opportunity to step up and be a, a documentation manager, why not? I thought, uh, why not? I can actually solve those problems. I could be a superhero, and I can go and solve every single of them, one by one. And actually, when I became a documentation manager, so I looked at the content from a completely different perspective, I realized that those questions are still in place, so they are still valid, but uh, Instead of having only those, I got many of other questions that are really very, very complex, and solution for them is not so straightforward. So this, is, uh, this applies to um, my both companies uh, I worked for. So I thought at some point in time that I missed something. And the thing I, I, I miss is some kind of strategy, is some kind of high-level high plan. So, probably some of you heard about uh, content strategy term. If you read about technical writing, if you read about documentation, probably you stumble upon about, uh, on, uh, on the content strategy uh, term. We have also a content strategist here with us. Uh, and documentation strategist uh, with us. So, I would like to kind of differentiate those two terms, content strategy and documentation strategy. Because what does it mean to, to me to have a documentation strategy? For me, it means that you need to properly uh, deal with uh, team issues, team problems, you need to set that team properly and mm, like put a spirit into it. And then another huge uh, or uh, very important ingredient is a content strategy. And those two, some, some of those two uh, ingredients gives us a documentation strategy. So that's the foundation for, for this presentation, and I'm going to stick to it. But what, you, you may ask me, what exactly does it mean? As I said, I'm a football fan, so uh, for me it's like how to, do, how to uh, transfer the ball from one post to another and score. 
So you need to know your point A and point B, and you need to know how to get there. But it's very important to know your uh, point A, so where you are, and you need to know your point B, so where do you want to be. And documentation strategy is, I would say, a high-level plan that gives you uh, some rules, that gives you a set uh, of recommendations to go through uh, the speech and score. What does it mean in practice? Uh, to be honest, I, I didn't know when I, when I started. And once I joined uh, my current company, Unit4, uh, a higher manager asked me to, to build a, a documentation strategy. And I thought, what the hell does it, uh, what, what the hell it is? It is. And I had some experience as a technical writer and documentation manager, so I thought, it shouldn't be a big deal. For me, a documentation strategy is kind of set of different things. Starting from the tool stack, so the hardware, how we, hardware and software, how you build uh, your, your documentation. It's also about processes, so how you do this, how you perform certain actions, uh, how you cooperate with your, with your partners, with your stakeholders. But the most important thing is your, your team. Most important uh, ingredient uh, is people. But everything is encapsulated, and this is a very, very important uh, factor here. Uh, most of the people forget about it. It's the company environment, because you deal, you work, in a certain environment, so you need to make sure that you understand how this environment uh, works. So what are the dependencies, what are the constraints, what you can do, what you cannot do, and uh, this part, so company environment, gives you some kind of frame. One of the very, very important uh, element of the company environment is the place in the, in the organization. If you work for a startup, you don't have any problems. If you work in a very small team, you don't have any problems because you know everyone. But if you are in a huge corporation, and I used to work in a really huge uh, company, and my current company is also kind of very, very big, you need to understand where you are, which is not so straightforward sometimes. If you are in a, in a department uh, containing developers, containing testers, that's fine. If you are in R&D, perfect. But sometimes you are in a completely different place. And you need to realize that sometimes it affects what you are doing and what you are going to do. So. This is a very, very important thing when you consider to build a documentation strategy for your, for your team. So how to start? Actually, I didn't know, so I had to try out. And my first approach was to observe. I started to ask questions, meet people, talk to different uh, uh, different managers from different departments. Uh, I observed uh, technical writers I actually met when I joined the company as a documentation manager because before I joined the company, uh, for a time being, there were no technical writers due to some reorg changes. Uh, companies started to hire them. So they also like had their own way of working and in my opinion, it's, it's pretty important to understand what they are doing, and not only what technical writers are doing, but also what R&D is doing, what engineering is doing, what testers are doing, how they, how they develop, what, what's the life cycle, what, uh, what kind of elements uh, are important to them, what processes they use. 
this is uh, so observation. It's it's a perfect first step, but you cannot actually uh, sit and observe, or you cannot stand and observe all the time because you need to proceed, right? So of course there is option two. Uh, do, do you play strategy games? Actually, uh, like. Several years ago, I, I loved strategy games. Currently, I don't have much time, to be honest. Uh, but if you uh, need to go for a mission, so you need to invade a, a castle or you need to defend your own castle, you need to make sure that you have resources, that you, need, that you have enough resources to... Um, to be in that uh, campaign for a longer period of time. Because I didn't mention that um, implementing a strategy, it's actually a process. So it's not like one-time job. You implement it in a certain amount of uh, months, so it's actually time-consuming uh, activity. So, how can you know that you have enough resources? Of course, you can conduct an audit. And I would like your attention on, on, on this part, because as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, you need to know your point A in order to get to point B. So conducting an audit, it's a key element in the in the establishing uh, strategy process. Um, of course, there are a couple of um, different elements you can check during the, the audit. However, I listed um, most important elements that, uh, that work for me. So I concentrated on uh, uh, several different uh, aspects, like type of content, uh, requirements, but before you gather the requirements, you need to know who can actually give you those requirements. So you need to understand your internal stake stakeholders, and of course, you need to understand your external stakeholders' requirements. But if you don't know them, uh, I realize that it's important to understand your internal stakeholders first before you go to external stakeholders, so your customers. If you know requirements, you need to review your processes. You need to also check what's the quality level of the uh, delivery items. And what is also a second uh, part of that, uh, of that model, you need to check your information uh, architecture. You need to check effectiveness of your information model. And a small thing that actually caused many problems to me uh, you need to really make sure that you that you know where your people are located and what they are doing. When I joined the company, uh, technical writers were uh, assigned to Scrum teams. So it is uh, what actually Wukash mentioned. If you work uh, in in R and D as a technical writer, it's better to be close to to R and D. I totally agree with that. But sometimes when you join the company and uh, there is no documentation manager, there was no person responsible for, uh, for coordinating the documentation, you simply don't know certain things. And I'm not going to talk about uh, how to perform this audit. It's, it's like uh, asking and... Uh, asking people and uh, listing down the, uh, the answers. So, but the very important and very um, helpful uh, tool for you is to review those uh, audit results and building so-called SWOT analysis. Probably you, you are aware of the, of the concept. So before you do the, the SWOT analysis, you, of course, need to uh, concentrate on certain aspects that uh, are very important to you. For me, as I mentioned, uh, content types, 
processes and uh, way of working, so uh, I wanted to really know how we are aligned with R&D way of working. I wanted to know uh, how far we are, uh, what I need to do uh, in order to adjust to their uh, way of working. So uh, efficiency in, uh, in, this, uh, in this process was uh, extremely important to me. Of course, because we have limited time and limited resources, so I need to. I had to deal with uh, with those limitations. So I concentrated on the process and uh, aligning this process into into R and D way of working. I also uh, came up came up with a with a conclusion that we need to have some kind of standard. So in my current company, uh, technical writers that were very very independent uh, use Microsoft Style Guide. So uh, I came up with a conclusion that actually I wasn't I wasn't sure whether whether they followed that uh, that style guide, whether they followed any rules. At some point in time, I had really uh, mixed feelings about uh, about the content quality. So in my opinion, uh, I I came up with a conclusion that we need some kind of style guide and templates, so everyone is doing the same thing. So we are aligning, we are unifying. So I, I, I wanted to avoid a situation when uh, technical writers from one team, from one domain, uh, do, uh, do completely different uh, stuff than from, for example, uh, my other uh, writers from product B, for example. And you need to establish a very clear quality criteria. And by quality cr criteria, um, you can actually take into account uh, really many different, uh, different aspects. But for me, quality uh, is equal to, um, to processes and to control, which uh, is uh, something that I'm going to talk in a second. And the information model, so how effective you are in transferring the information from R&D to your customers. I'm not going to talk about, you know, bridges, uh, etc. But just to let you know, having the uh, effective information model will help you. You will see in a second why. I mentioned SWOT. SWOT is it's pretty simple tool, so you just list strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, threats. So for opportunities, I, for example, listed that uh, technical writers are working very closely to, uh, to R&D, so they are a part of the team. Even though we are a team, a technical writer or writing team, they are actually sitting next to uh, testers and developers, which was very, very important uh, part of that, uh, of that plan. So we didn't, we didn't sit together like, you know, uh, next to each other. We were, uh, technical writers were and are sitting next to uh, their domain developers. Then you need to know what are the weaknesses of your, uh, of your potential strategy, what are the strengths and threats. Having SWOT uh, should give you uh, a kind of uh, requirement list or can help you with defining key elements of your of your strategy again uh, I don't want to give you any any like solution for all the problems what you see here is uh, is built on my experience and it works for for me but it it, it doesn't it doesn't work uh, it doesn't need to work for you so here you have elements I concentrate, I focused on. As I mentioned, people. So you need to have a very uh, good team, motivated team that will uh, follow you and they will implement the strategy uh, in, a, in a very effective way. Then uh, main stakeholders, you need to simply identify them. As I mentioned, I, I've, I've been working and I work in a huge uh, organization, so uh, knowing who can I work with, it's crucial. So you need to know who is your partner, 
and who can help you, who can support you, or who can sometimes make some troubles to you. Then tool stock. So how do you actually create the content? I mean, uh, technically, which CMS you use, which editor you use? Uh, do you have any tools for work tracking? That's also very important. Then the information model mentioned earlier, and content quality. Last two bullets uh, are about money. And uh, we've already heard uh, how important localization and translation is. So I don't want to go into much details about localization. But believe me, this is a huge topic. And you cannot, uh, you cannot like, Mm, make it. Uh, you, you should you should make it a, a, a big deal for you, because uh, in fact it brings cost. It brings uh, additional step in your process, and it involves uh, sometimes lots of uh, lots of resources. So, speaking in human language, so it involves your technical writers doing certain uh, certain activities. But speaking about money, uh, because in, uh, in many presentations, in many uh, slides set regarding technical writing, like I didn't, I didn't see much about money. But in fact, we need to uh, understand that what technical writers are doing and what I'm doing as, a, as their manager costs. So we need to be aware about certain costs, and we need to eliminate wastes. That's why I mentioned process as a key element. But we also need to take uh, into cons consideration uh, costs of licenses, uh, costs of trainings, costs of onboarding, and this kind of stuff. So people, you may feel that uh, I'm a crazy guy, but I, I really always wanted to build my team in a similar way as a uh, football team is built. So I wanted to have Lewandowski as a striker, so my uh, content architect, who will be a kind of leader. I wanted to have uh, Zielinski, who will be a playmaker. I wanted to have strong wingers, uh, so my key users, so guys who will be taking care about uh, my tools. And uh, I, want, I, I always wanted to be a goalie. I wanted to protect them. So being a Fabianski or Szczęsny, that, that was also, always my, my dream. So having a, a strong team with certain, uh, let's say, level of skills, definitely will, will help you. It's not always uh, a straight, for, uh, a, mm, a simple thing to, to hire those people, especially if you, if you operate in a, in a market where uh, it's pretty uh, difficult to find technical writers or there is no profession like technical writing. But our uh, main assumption was that they should be very close to R&D, so we need to somehow onboard them. We need to train them anyway. So we need to hire people with a certain level of motivation, and we need to train them. Train them. We need to invest in them. What else? It's very, very important to allocate those people wisely. So you cannot actually make Lewandowski a goalie and Fabianski a striker. So if you identified certain skills uh, so your people can do certain things, like you have a technical writer with, I don't know, certain, certain skills, like they can code, for example. They can make some scripts. Use this. Use this fact. Allocate them properly. If you cannot do that, you simply need to invest in them. It's also very important, uh, this fact I, I mentioned. So if you operate in many countries, uh, you need to make sure that people uh, communicate uh, to each other. 
So if you have a virtual team or a semi-virtual team, so we have people in different countries, make sure that you are a team, that you uh, talk to each other. So you have, they have a mean, or you, you together with, uh, with your team have a mean to, to communicate. In my case, for example, Slack works, works very, very good. Of course, we have our team page, we have meetings, uh, we discuss certain, uh, certain problems, we have a team uh, technical writing guild for you know, knowledge sharing. So those things are, are pretty important. So for me, people, team, uh, this is a key element in the, in the documentation strategy. Then stakeholders. In huge organizations, you can actually identify many different organizations or uh, the disciplines that can help you. Those yellow ones, uh, and all of them are actually from my organization, current organization, and I identify those that are crucial, are key for my technical writers. You probably may ask why I haven't uh, marked UX. Probably it was by mistake. <laughs> but uh, why product management? Because we have all the requirements directly from product management. Product services, because they are second line of support. Customer support, because they get tickets from customers. Professional services, because they are fighting in a you know, customer's field, so they, uh, they know best how our uh, software works. Then tool stack. So for me, it was extremely important, as I mentioned, to use uh, a common tool stack. And uh, sometimes, uh, I, and I know it from, from my experience, that uh, R&D engineering is, doing, uh, is, is working using completely different tools. For example, they have Jira and we are using Excel. They have Confluence and we have something completely different like TeamSight. So you need to understand that having common baseline, common tool stack will definitely help you. So I always wonder how we can actually work having completely different, uh, different tools, different, uh, different software. And in my organization, uh, we use same tools. We actually have a Microsoft partnership and we use Team Foundation Server, which is a software repository and a tool for tracking, uh, tracking the work progress. And what you see here on the, on the right-hand side is a, a list of user stories, uh, documentation tasks. So this is an evidence that technical writers actually work uh, directly with, with R&D, so we can track the progress, you can see how many stories are completed, because of course we are a part of definition of done. We are part of definition of done and what we are doing uh, is valid for, uh, for the future planning and future realization. How it affects, uh, how using uh, common tool affects technical writing. Uh, we produce con contextual help and our uh, editor is Matt Kapfler. We integrated, actually it was integrated uh, before I joined the company, but uh, having the integration with a uh, tool that is used by R&D gives us a possibility to, uh, to work in the same life cycle, in the same uh, release cycle. So um, writers can easily and actually immediately see uh, what they produced and it's, uh, it actually allows uh, and makes the review process uh, smooth. So uh, our reviewers, our SMEs can actually go to the online help and check it. It's a completely um, different story when it comes to PDFs because we are also uh, producing PDFs but I'm gonna, gonna talk about it 
in a second. Information model. When I started to investigate what we deliver, I realized that we have so many documentation types. And my first thought what was, why we have so many? The maintenance is so costly, it takes some time. And most of those, mm, uh, those elements, th those documents were PDFs. So our uh, internal portal uh, was and still is a SharePoint. So we need to take one document, put into SharePoint, uh, inform your SME that uh, the document is ready for the review. So you can imagine if you have so many documentation types, it's actually, it's time consuming. So again, having limited resources, limited time, you need to do something with it. And my idea was to reduce those elements. So I came up with a new information model, which actually took into consideration also the localization aspect, so translations. And I divided the content into two groups, one for end users, like an average John who is sitting next to the application and need to perform some actions, like for example, register an invoice, and documentation for super users. And this is kind of phenomena in my, uh, in my company because uh, nobody knows who super user is, but we were trying you know, to talk to uh, more experienced people, to UX team, uh, so they are Mm, they mm, produced or they developed a persona for us, so we more or less know that those people are uh, functional impl uh, implementation consultants, uh, admins, etc. But this documentation, uh, in our idea, in my idea, shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be translated. Translated, so it's kind of. Uh, cost saving from one side, but it, it's, it's also a uh, time saving for technical writers and uh, localization specialists who actually coordinate the, the translation process. Uh, when it comes to types, we actually decided, so I decided to, to make four main uh, documentation types like UI strings and everything what is related to the UI, online help, which is contextual online help embedded into the software, and a uh, couple of uh, like informative documents, release notes and reference manuals that cover actually uh, certain, certain things. So they are good from the process perspective and implementation perspective. When it comes to quality, um, I didn't invent a wheel, so this is kind of a uh, standard process con uh, containing the several steps well known to almost every technical writer. Define, write, then peer review, meaning check the language quality, then review it against the functional uh, correctness, test it, and this is also uh, good to mention that uh, we also have two types of tests, uh, testing by technical writers and testing by testers, so the functional testing. They just click the application and check whether the, the online help is, is popping up. Then publishing and maintaining. And as we are working agile, uh, it should be a circle, so uh, please, uh, please note it uh, also th this fact. And uh, having this uh, very simplified process, uh, I was trying to answer a few, like four main questions. What, who, how, and where? Uh, in what, uh, it can be actually anything. So what I deliver, uh, what, uh, what should I do with this content? Who is my SME? How should I write this or that? Having, for example, templates, it will simplify it. Where should I publish? So 
those elements are uh, those ingredients are part of the uh, quality element. How to transfer it in a uh, let's say developer's language? So make a chart. Uh, I heard today that they like charts, so maybe that would be useful for them. Define roles, like technical writer is at the top, but we have also business analyst, scrum team, scrum master. So and make it in steps, like uh, in every step they need to know uh, what exactly is expected from them. And localization. So it's very important to understand how localization is costly and how complex is this process. It affects um, your current process, your development process, in a way that you need to plan it plan in advance because it's really, really time consuming. In my organization, online help contains uh, around 4 million words. So translating uh, it into one language takes like three months. So you can imagine, I'm really uh, excited about uh, the fact that uh, translators can be, you know, involved into the development process on a very, very early stages. So I need to investigate that. But uh, when it comes to localization in, in, in my company, we just started, so uh, don't have much experience. Currently, we have only one vendor. Uh, we examine the, another possibilities. But this is very important. I don't want to go into uh, much details here, but uh, probably you, you will hear from, from Marta tomorrow and you've, you've already uh, heard something uh, today. So last but not least, money. As I mentioned, you need to take care of money. So you need to know where you spend. You need to know how to and where hire technical writers. You need to take into consideration what, what's the attrition rate. For example, if you hire in country A, you need to know what will happen with those people. Are they going to live? Are they going to stay with you? So this is, this is also quite important. From my experience, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty important to realize that having a community of writers uh, in a certain country helps a lot. So that's why I'm here. That's why I'm at, at, at SOAP. And uh, I believe that uh, strengthening the skills and awareness of technical writing helps organization um, with uh, budget planning as well. I mentioned already about licenses, uh, about trainings, onboarding. So this costs, be aware of that. So finally, how I build the strategy pillars. First and most important thing is that the technical writer is a part of the team and translation is your key enabler. So it actually, uh, it pushes you or uh, requires uh, certain actions from you. When it comes to content, uh, again, I didn't, I didn't invent a wheel, so some of those uh, elements are already, were already mentioned today. So I would like my content to be easy to translate, find, read, be consistent, and engaging. Then implementation. So I used a very, very well-known uh, design, measure, analyze, improve, and control process. But what I would like to stress is the communication part. Because what will happen with, with your great strategy if you actually do not communicate it properly? So I'm a supporter of over-communicating. So tell even more people about your strategy, about your plans, about your uh, achievements, because they should know you are a part of the, uh, of the team. So finally, some... Tips from my side, make it simple. If you make it simple and you present it to higher managers, they understand. 
copy-pasting doesn't work, and I'm not talking about content. I'm not talking about uh, copying content from a design and put it into the, into the document. I'm talking about copying way of working from a one place and adapting, in, adapting it in another place. So I thought that what I've learned in one company can be easily adapted in another company. That's not true. That's not true. Organizations uh, differ. Be aware of that. And assumptions uh, lead to disaster. And actually, I made many, many mistakes. And I had many, many problems uh, while making, you know, uh, because of making some assumptions. So be careful. Don't make assumptions. It's better to ask more questions than make a stupid mistake. And don't break things that already work. So you don't need to improve everything. If something works, just leave it. It, it should, uh, if, if it worked, it should work uh, as well in, in, your new, in your new strategy. Then about the company structure, as I said, it determines many, many, many aspects. Over-communicated, I already uh, mentioned. And last thing, but not least, documentation is a part of a product, always. So that brings me to, to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tomek. <clears throat> okay, we can afford just one question. Who was the first one? Uh, okay, let's go for two, and we'll have Wojtek uh, and Wojtek. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for a great presentation, Tomek. Um, I have one question, and in, in one slide you mentioned that you look for um, additional talents in, in, in your technical writing team, for example, for coding or doing other stuff. I wonder what's your strategy on um, dividing technical writers' work. Um, do you, for example, suggest them to do a time split? For example, I don't know, 80% is a project work and 20% additional stuff, or do you have any other strategy on that? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, Wojtek. Thanks for that. So uh, my strategy, if, if uh, I may call it a strategy, is to give them uh, a space for trying out different different things. So if they would like to code, I will make sure that they will have a time to, to code or to ask uh, questions to testers, work together with testers, try out certain things with developers. So I'm not sure whether it's a strategy, it's kind of, I'm, I'm up to it. Like, I, I like it, I like to give people freedom, so they can contribute into certain things. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'd like to first comment on the presentation. I can relate to most of the things you said. And you said that it's not, uh, copy-paste doesn't work, but m many, many things you said actually are very similar to my uh, experience. So. If you listened carefully, yes, he's right. Uh, and um, you said about assumptions, and I actually have two questions, but you can choose which one you, you answer. Um, uh, which assumption was like the greatest mistake in your opinion that you made? What, what, what kind of an assumption? And the second question is, how do you defend yourself against making assumptions? Hmm, I'll take the first one. So I, I assume that everyone understands me, which is not completely true. So if you say something once, probably you need to be ready to explain it twice or even more times. So you, you remember, Wojtek, the over-communicating bullet. So I'm, I actually, that, that, that's, that's my problem. Uh, lack of communication sometimes brings you to some trouble, so it's better to over-communicate. Thank you. Okay, okay guys. Uh, Tomek, thank you a lot. Uh, thank you, guys.